Hi everybody, it's so good to see you today. Did you know that 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment? It became a law in 1920 and is celebrated for giving women the right to vote. Unfortunately, the 19th Amendment didn't give all women the right to vote. It only gave white women the right to vote. The right to vote for all women and men, no matter race or ethnicity, happened because of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 2020 is also an election year. People will be casting their vote for president and many other positions. We're still struggling for everyone to have the right to vote today in the United States, but this book shows some of the history of the struggle for many people to vote. Because of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, we're a little bit closer to achieving voter equality. I wanted to read this book because it's about an inspiring 100-year-old woman who saw a lot of things in her lifetime. It gives some of the history of her ancestors, the ways that people were kept from voting, and the way that people of color fought for the right to vote. A Celebration of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Lillian's Right to Vote by Jonah Winter, and Shane W. Evans, published by Schwartz and Wade Books. In this book, you're going to see Lillian climbing a mountain. The mountain is a metaphor for her struggle for equality and the right to vote. When Lillian walks, she remembers the things she's seen and tells the stories of how the Voting Rights Act of 1965 came to be and all the struggles along the way for justice. Lillian's Right to Vote. A very old woman stands at the bottom of a hill, of a very steep hill. It's voting day. She's an American, and by God, she is going to vote. Lillian is her name. It's a long haul up that steep hill. It's a long haul when you've been alive for a hundred years. It's a long haul when you've lived the life that Lillian has and walked so far in her shoes. When Lillian looks up, it's more than blue skies she sees. She sees history. Lillian sees her great, great grandparents, Elijah and Sarah. They are standing side by side on an auction block. Sarah is holding their baby Edmund. They are being sold as slaves in front of the very same Alabama courthouse where rich white men and no one else is allowed to vote. Lillian starts her slow climb through the sun. Though the sun shines brightly, Lillian sees a dark time from years past. She sees her great grandpa Edmund, now grown. He is owned by another man, forced to pick cotton from daybreak to nightfall. Right here in this country, where it is written that all men are created equal. He sure doesn't have the right to vote. In fact, he doesn't have the right to do much at all until after the Civil War, which will end slavery. So this is Lillian remembering and recounting the story of her ancestors. As Lillian inches up the hill past one neighbor's house and then the next, she sees her great grandpa Edmund on his way to vote for the first time. Thanks to a law that was passed in 1870, the law is the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which says that American citizens' right to vote shall not be denied or abridged on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Even though the law does not allow women to vote, Great Grandma Ida is with her husband. Lillian feels their dignity and their pride as they enter that courthouse for the first time. So she's talking about in history when men of color were allowed to vote for the first time. And you'll notice that Lillian, she's kind of in full color here and that shows in the story that it's the present day and Lillian is about to vote. When there's, um, the characters are more in like one color and they don't have lots of colors and they're kind of muted, that's when she's remembering and it's from the past. That's showing the past. But as Lillian continues and the hill gets steeper, my, but that hill is steep. She sees what happens just 20 years later, right here in Alabama. 
There's her grandpa Isaac at the courthouse being charged a poll tax to vote, a tax he doesn't have the money to pay. So much for that 15th Amendment. So much for Grandpa Isaac's right to vote. So then they took away people's right to vote by making them pay to be able to vote, money that people didn't have. Lillian pauses to catch her breath, hearing now the voice of her uncle Levi. He is telling about those tests that he was forced to take when he tried to vote, and about the sneer on the registrar's face when he asked, how many bubbles are in a bar of soap? Her uncle's lips go tight as he recalls being asked to name all 67 judges in the state of Alabama and being turned away when he failed to answer such questions. And that was another way where they stopped people from being able to vote by asking them questions that nobody knew the answers to. As Lillian pushes on, struggling to keep her balance, she sees a brave girl standing next to her mother and father as they try to register to vote. The year is 1920, and the 19th Amendment has just passed, a law allowing women to vote. The girl is Lillian herself, with her mama and papa. They are being chased away by an angry mob. There is Mr. Bentley, the barber, and Mr. McCrory, who owns the ice cream shop. She feels the firm grip of her mother's hand as they run through the streets back home. And though today the birds are singing and people are smiling, Lillian sees in vivid orange and brilliant red the cross burning on the lawn of her girlhood home, set aflame by the same angry mob just because her parents want to vote. This is something she will always see. Lillian stops in her tracks, unable to keep going. As she stands there, she sees herself trying to register to vote for the very first time. She sees the blank piece of paper on which she must write down a section of the U.S. Constitution, word for word, as it is being mumbled by the registrar, a test she could not pass. No one could. Are you going to vote, she asks a young man who passes her on her route. Yes, ma'am, he answers. You better, she says, and she means it. So here is Lillian in the present day asking this young man if he's voting. And here she is the first time she tried to vote and they stopped her by asking her a test that she can answer. And she's she knows how hard it was to get the right to vote. And so she's urging him to vote too. For Lillian, for Lillian sees the funeral procession for a man named Jimmy Lee Jackson a 26-year-old shot by a policeman over nothing more than taking part in a peaceful protest. It is March 1965, and all he'd wanted was justice and the right to vote. Looking up to the top of the hill, Lillian wonders how she'll ever make it. It looks so far. She's so tired. Though her feet and legs ache with 100 years of walking, what fuels her ancient body is seeing those 600 people beginning a peaceful protest march from Selma to Montgomery. People who, though they don't know it yet, will be stopped on a bridge in Selma by policemen with clubs. All they want is justice and the right to vote. At the front is future Congressman John Lewis, whose forehead will always bear the scar from where he was beaten. As long as Lillian still has a pulse, she is going to vote. And so she keeps on climbing, keeps on seeing, this time the second march from Selma. This march also ends on the bridge in a prayer led by Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., whose dreams of justice for African Americans are already famous. Wherever he went, he lifted people up with his words, and his words still lift up Lillian, who seeing the top of the hill is not about to stop. Footstep by footstep, she keeps on going. Just as the marchers from Selma to Montgomery keep on going through the cold and rain, finally making it all the way to Montgomery on their third march, she sees them all, Martin Luther King, John Lewis, rabbis, priests, 
and 25,000 others. Lillian is there. She can still hear Reverend King asking how long they would have to wait for justice. She can still feel the power of his voice when he says, not long. And as she takes those final steps to the top of the hill, Lillian can still see how Reverend King was right, for she can hear the voice of President Lyndon Johnson on her TV saying to America, every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. There is no duty which weighs more heavily on us than the duty we have to ensure that right. All of us must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice, and we shall overcome. Before Lillian walks through the doors of the building where you better believe she will vote, she looks up and sees the same blue sky, brighter than any sky she's ever seen, that she saw on August 6th, 1965. That was the day President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, the one law protecting all Americans' right to vote in every state and every town, the one law protecting Lillian as a full-fledged citizen of the United States. She enters the building and as Lillian steps into the voting booth, once again, she sees herself stepping into the voting booth in 1965 for the very first time. And she knows full well she would not be standing here today were it not for the people who marched and the people who died for her right to vote. Lillian touches her fingers to the lever and because she is a citizen of the United States of America, protected by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Here she is in 1965 and here she is present day. Lillian pushes that lever. Lillian votes. There's some information here about the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which allowed many more people to vote. If you have any questions about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 or want to learn more about it, you can look it up. You can ask me. Um, and I love this book because it's a reminder that, you know, the struggle and the fight for justice isn't just us today. It's all of our ancestors and it's the people who fought for justice before and they all walk with Lillian in this in this book as she walks and as she goes to vote and here she is walking down the hill after she voted I hope you enjoyed this book I look forward to seeing you next time